There are two things I think most students have convinced themselves of. The first is that learning is a one-way street. You're taking in information because you don't know anything, and the second is that you're not questioning this information that you're receiving. When you do these two things, it makes it very difficult to learn and do at the same time, and this makes it almost impossible to have an impact as a student. I'm going to talk to you today about some steps where you can go from finding a problem you care about to actually having an impact as a student. So as a student, it's great because your full-time job is to learn, and you get to steer this towards your interests and your passions. Um, and with this, you can really start to delve deep into a subject you care about. And when you get deeper in your studies, what you'll find is there are very basic problems that still exist even though these jobs and positions have been around for decades or centuries. And this is where you can start to have an impact even as a young student. So a lot of these steps to go from just finding something that you care about to actually having an impact are very basic. The first is just find a problem. So find a problem you care about. And it's important to care about this problem because that's what directly correlates to how much energy, effort, and uh, enthusiasm you'll have when you're pursuing this project. And it's important to have this care because it's not just something that you're going to want to do one time and solve and then leave it. You know, you're not getting a grade. You want to make it have an impact on real people's lives. And so it doesn't have to be something that you stay up at night thinking about or something that's been your lifelong dream. Just something that when the first, the tenth, or the hundredth person tells you that your idea is crap, that you'll say, that's fine. I'm going to go back to the drawing board. I'm going to pivot, and I'm going to try a different solution. Um, so this could be any problem. It could be something in your field. It could be something that affects you in your personal life. It could be something that affects others. Really, it could be anything like solving a disease, um, doing a human study. Maybe it's getting uh, access, getting kids interested in the higher culture of Dr. Seuss. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. For us, it was, or for me, it was robotics. So when I started in high school, I was really interested in robotics, and it was most exciting for me when I applied robotics to people and allowed them to do more things. And so here you'll see the two main existing solutions to upper limb amputation. So if you lost your hand, you would get one of these devices. On the left, you have a prosthetic hook. It's a very simple device. It only opens and closes. It's operated by a cable that runs from the hand to the opposite shoulder, and the user hunches and opens their shoulders just to open and close the hand. So it's pretty awkward, not very, but not very intuitive. Um, but they are very cheap and durable. And because of this, they're widespread. So you'll see a lot of them in developing nations. On the other hand, uh, we have a myoelectric prosthetic device. This is just a muscle-controlled prosthetic. It's the state of the art. It's the cutting edge. How it works is there are sensors that are placed around an amputee's existing forearm muscle. And when they go to do any task, we can read the muscle activity happening and adjust the hand position accordingly. So say you're going to grab a cup. We know when you reach for that cup that you want to do a power grip and grab it versus when you grab a pencil, doing a fine pinch. So this allows you to interact with many more objects and really accomplish a lot more with your device, not to mention it's very intuitive because it's just using your muscles how you normally would. So this is great, uh, but unfortunately, it's very expensive. They typically cost thirty to $40,000, and this really limits who has access to the device and how many people can benefit from this technology. So once you have the problem that you care about, uh, it's important to make a team and find other people that care about this same problem. So this can be, again, it's very open-ended. It could be students, professors, professionals in your area, somebody you email across the globe, whoever can help you uh, find the solution to what you care about. So I started this like every college student looking for answers. I Googled it. Um, I looked up robotics professors at U of I when I was coming as a freshman, and I said, great. I knocked on their doors during the first week, and I said, you know, this is what I'm interested in. I know what you work on. How can I be involved? And a lot of them said, you can't. You're a freshman. You know, we don't need you yet. Come back. Um, and I was like, oh, darn. But I kept going, and about the fifth or the sixth professor I talked to, um, it was actually the Brettle Research Group. They work on prosthetics, and they said, that's awesome. Come on in. And I joined a team of many different disciplines of engineering, neuroscience, and biology. And this was really the exact backgrounds needed to start having an impact on prosthetics. So joining this team, um, it wasn't an easy process. And I encourage you, when you go and you look for these people, just put yourself out there. There's no easy way to do this. You know, go talk to a professor. Go call a professional. Go get a group of students together. Tell them what you're passionate about. And just tell them how you want to try and solve the problem. I've seen a five-minute conversation or a nicely worded email um, to somebody who's world famous in prosthetics turn into a two-hour conversation just because I told them how I was interested in their work and what I wanted to do with it. Um, so it's not. Not the simplest process, but once you have this idea um, and you can start talking to them about what you really care about, it's amazing to see 
the reception and the work that you can generate together. So our work in the lab actually first started having impact when we reached out to people. So there was a prosthetist who came and spoke at U of I. He runs a nonprofit prosthetics clinic with patients in Ecuador and Guatemala. And so after his talk, we connected with him and we said, you know, we really love what you do. Uh -huh. This is what we've been working on. How can we get involved? And this sparked a collaboration where we would develop things in Illinois. We'd send them via email to Ecuador and Guatemala where they would 3D print them and start putting them on patients. So we took this, uh, impact, this research that we were doing in the lab. By talking to people, we started giving it real impact and allowing it to access patients and start changing some lives. So once you have the problem you care about, you have your team, uh, you can start going on the knowledge discovery process. And I call it knowledge discovery because you may not even know what you need to learn yet. And that's fine because as a student, you have a ton of resources. You have teachers, you have professionals, other students that are excited. You can take courses, you can look online, you can read research papers, whatever you need. Um, the most important thing is to really get to the root of the issue. You know, find the base problem, where the pain is. So this could be, you know, what's the cause of a disease? Why do people act a certain way? Why don't kids like green eggs and ham? It's the fundamental issues that you need to start looking at. And so for us, and for me, um, it was what challenges do people face to get these state-of-the-art prosthetic hands? We found in literature that there are 11.4 million hand amputees in the world. 80% of them live in developing nations. Only 3% of those patients have access to affordable prosthetic devices. You have this huge patient population that has no way to get these very advanced, intuitive, useful devices into their life. And so looking at this, we could start really boiling the problem down to the solution. And that is we needed to be able to overcome limited prosthetists so they didn't have professionals who could get them these devices. They had difficulty affording the devices and they had difficulty repairing the devices once they broke. Um, so once you have the idea you care about, you have your team and you've gone on knowledge discovery, you can start to execute. So executing is just iteratively trying to solve the problem and it's, there's no simple or straightforward way to do it. You just gotta keep trying until something sticks. Um, this could be you know, developing a new medicine, testing the difference between happiness and income, or starting a book club and getting kids counting redfish, bluefish. For us, it was developing an open source prosthetic hand tact. So tact's cool because it's open source, so that means you can get the files online, then you just download them and you have instructions. You can 3D print them and then go to your local hardware store, get a couple nuts and bolts, and you can actually make this hand. It costs 1% of the existing commercial devices and it has all the same specifications that these very expensive commercial devices have. So it can apply the same force at the fingertip. It can move at the same speed. It's the same size and weight, so it's just as useful. In this video here, you can see me assembling the device using only one of my hands. And this is a really cool feature that I designed so that patients, amputees, can build it themselves with only one hand. So you've overcome all of those issues of not having a prosthetist, not being able to afford the device, and not being able to repair it. The coolest project, or the coolest part of this project for me has been the global impact. So I've gotten feedback from people. I get an email about once a week from people in India, China, um, the US, and most recently in the Middle East. There was a girl in Jordan working with Syrian refugees. And these patients, or these people, they all contact me and they say, we're interested in this problem, we love your solution, you know, here's our advice, uh, how to change and make it better, how can we Im be involved in solving this problem of prosthetics and making it uh, available to more people. And it's very encouraging to see something that I've worked on um, originally just as a first and second year student go around the world and have an impact on real lives and come back to me and have feedback and have uh, advice on how we can further solve this problem. And it's been amazing and a great opportunity once you put yourself out there and you start solving this problem to connect with others that care about this problem because we could test on patients uh, in the Middle East or in Asia and we could get more feedback and really impact more lives by leveraging these these people that are interested in solving this problem. So having found this uh, problem, made a team, gone on knowledge discovery and executed a solution, we decided that we had not solved, uh, had not changed the world how we wanted to change the world. So people are still buying these expensive devices. People still don't have as much access as we would like. And so we decided we were gonna def define a new problem. And that is, how do we develop a system that we can sell through the traditional methods, so with prosthetists in clinics to patients, um, and directly compete with these expensive devices and make them for low cost. So we formed a subset of our existing team. We founded a company, Psionic, and we started on the knowledge discovery process again. And this time, we focused on startups. So we, we formed a company, right, and we went on these startup boot camps where we learned how to run a business, how to get our device FDA registered, how to get it insured, 
Um, and we really made a huge list of prosthetists and amputees because we wanted to get to the core issues of what they needed solved. So we told them about our research solutions and we asked them, you know, what's the biggest problem with these devices? Universally, they told us one thing, that our research idea was crap and they hated it. <laughs> and that was fine because they told us the biggest issue was that it wasn't durable. They wanted a hand that wouldn't break because these expensive devices were already breaking and our 3D printed one was even weaker. So we said, okay. Maybe we can't make it for 1% of the cost. Maybe we can make it for 10% of the cost, but we'll make it much more robust and durable. And so this is a recent device, one of our most recent prototypes. A lot of things have changed. <laughs> you can see here metal gearing in the fingers. This makes it much stronger and more durable. Uh, there's rubber in the fingers and the palm, and this makes it, again, more durable, compliant, and more human-like. And it also allows us to do things like put pressure sensors in the fingertips. And by putting pressure sensors in the fingertips, we can solve a lot more, uh, many more problems with prosthetic devices. If you think about a prosthetic hand, it's just a lump of plastic and metal on your arm, right? You can't feel it, you don't know what it's doing unless you're staring at it. So by putting these sensors there, we can tell how much force the hand is applying. And so very difficult tasks like grabbing a plastic cup are made much simpler because it's a, it's a challenge to apply enough force to hold the cup and not too much force to crush the cup. But by using these sensors, we can use this information about force and really do some fine control. We can also give this information of the force they're applying directly to the user. So we can have them actually feel how much force they're applying, which makes it very intuitive to control their device and use it in real life. Um, so this is a continual process, you know, executing, trying to develop a solution. And we're hoping within this year that we'll have a product that will be FDA registered and we can actually sell to patients. So it's an ongoing process that we're still working on. Um, and we really care about it because of patients like Garrett. So Garrett is an Iraq war veteran. He lost his hand to a roadside bomb. He's an adventurous guy. He goes dirt biking with his prosthetic hand. You know, it hasn't slowed him down any. But this is what we want to do. We want to enable people to really live their life how they want to, how they want to live it. You know, be independent, do things you care about. Um, so if you can make a hand that's robust enough so that he can go dirt biking with it, or if you can make a hand that has enough control so that he can do some simple manipulation tasks and he doesn't have to use his other hand for everything. So it's useful for him to have this prosthetic. Uh, you know, that's the goal, that's why we care about it. It's been amazing um, to see myself learning engineering tasks and applying them directly because I, I feel like I have learned equal or more um, in this project than in my classes. And it definitely has a lot more impact and a lot more meaning to me and others like Garrett. So I think it's, it's a difficult thing to get involved in these kind of projects as a student because you do have a lot of, a lot of stuff going on, you know, coursework, jobs, social, whatever. Um, the most important thing to remember is that you have so many advantages as a student. Never in your life will you have so much time devoted to just pursuing passionate subjects and what you care about. You know, this is so easily applied to real life things um, where you can accomplish problems that impact people's lives. And so you have to remember that you have so many resources at whatever school. You know, you have professors, you have students, you have open labs, and you can use these for any project. People just want to see you be successful and see you really pursue what you want to do. You don't have to worry about making a living. You know, you're not supporting a family yet. You don't, you don't have a corporate hierarchy. Nobody's telling you what you can and can't do. And if you fail, it doesn't really matter. You know, you just go back to class. It's not a big deal. Um, so it's important to be mindful because you could do a project and you could get a grade, or you could do a project and you could see some impact. Thank you. <laughs>